afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Casey Shiley. I am the Florida Library Youth Program Youth Services Consultant. Many of you have probably seen my name come in through your email, um, but I'm really excited because I am seeing a lot of new names here today. Um, and that's always really exciting when I have an opportunity to uh, connect with new youth services staff in the field. Um, before I turn it over to Amy Jane, I did just want to take a quick moment and ask if you all would um, to share in the chat which library you're from. And I'm also really curious to know if you currently have a very robust and busy team program and you're just looking for new ways to expand programming or if your library is struggling to pull teams in and so you're looking for new ideas um, just because i know that for some libraries it's very easy for them to reach their teens and in some other communities uh, it's a little bit harder so with that i am incredibly excited and honored to introduce amy jane mcwilliam from the lee county library system um, so that she can share her teen summer of service program take it away amy jane Hi, thank you so much, Casey. Um, I am really excited to share with you my experience developing and hosting the Teen Summer of Service program. Um, I see a lot of you guys putting in that you have robust teen presence and, and, part, and some participation. Um, some have really great um, volunteer uh, programs already in place, and that's great. This will supplement that. I hope that you can take some of the things that I'm going to talk about um, today and, and apply it um, as a, a more flexible option for your teens. Um, I will share information about the program and then um, take questions at the end. Um, let Amy Jane, I think you may have accidentally self-muted. Oh, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, I'm a mess. <laughs> Not too much of a mess. Um, okay, so let me start. Uh, my name is Amy Jane McWilliam. I am the Youth Services Coordinator with the Lee County Library System. Um, so my role here is to oversee programs and services to children, teens, and families, and I provide uh, support to our youth services teams inside the branches. I've been with the Lee County System for about 18 years, and I've served in various roles, including um, as a teen librarian, and the library that I worked at was uh, in between a middle school and high school. So. Um, so actually we were quite busy. Um, I hold an MSI from FSU um, and also I live in Lee County with my husband. I have three daughters, two are teenagers. I have a 17 and 14 year old and a nine year old who thinks she's a teenager. Um, I also have two dogs, ironically one that looks very similar to Chewy over here. Not as big, but just don't tell him that. Um, so here's my info on the screen, and if you want to reach out at any point after the workshop today, you know, just definitely drop me a line. Okay, so I don't know about you, um, but I personally like to know what sort of library is pitching a program to me. Um, and so this is helpful uh, for me in managing my expectations and kind of understanding what sort of adjustments I, I might need to make um, in order to make this program successful in my community. So the Lee County Library System, we have 13 branches. We're located in Southwest Florida. It's the red, the red area there. Um, we have um, we are a county department. Um, we're overseen by a board of county commissioners. Um, we have about 250 folks on staff. I know the slide says 230, but we are growing, growing. Um, we have an online library that's available 24 seven. We offer mobile and outreach services uh, that bring deposit collections to community centers, uh, a talking li uh, books library for the visually impaired, uh, and a books uh, by mail service for the homebound. We also have a telephone reference department that handles ready reference and account services by phone, email, and chat. Um, and our library, like many others, offers free programs and large events to the community, and we rely on strong relationships with our community and organizational partners. Okay, 
Um, so today I'm going to share information about our Teen Summer of Service program. And it's uh, this program is actually a great example of the partnerships that I was just talking about. Um, Teen SOS was a pilot program that we launched this summer and due to the overwhelming need for service hours by teens in the community. So as you know, um, our teens need service hours to fulfill Bright Futures requirements, as well as other club and academic society requirements. So like National Honor Society. So, um, you know, I noticed that there were limited opportunities for teens to earn these hours. And some of that was due to COVID, but there's also age restrictions. And in general, teens have trouble getting um, getting to and from a facility. So that makes it difficult for them to participate in volunteer, uh, volunteer opportunities. So as a professional and a parent, I felt like that we really needed to create a flexible program that would circumvent these limitations and still provide a meaningful and ex uh, experience that, that's engaging and also interactive. So enter SOS. It is a six week virtual service learning program for teens ages 12 to 18. And the program features guest speakers, um, an examination of community issues, civic engagement and weekly projects to complete at home. And so uh, here's how it works. Um, so after teens register for the program, they pick up an activity kit at their closest library. Um, the kit includes supplies and instructions for the weekly projects. They uh, then attend weekly live workshops that feature a guest speaker from a local agency um, that helps the community. Um, and they help the community find solutions to an issue. So for example, Lee County Human and Veteran Services spoke about people experiencing homelessness in Lee County. And then they also spoke about the services and uh, the organization provides to help with that. So um, the speakers would talk for about 10 minutes um, and then the teens would have the opportunity to ask them questions. And the questions were fantastic, um, really thoughtful um, and you know, just really uh, sparked curiosity um, and, and uh, just great conversations from that. Um, so next I separated uh, the participants into breakout groups with um, a specific discussion question. They all had different discussion questions. And during this time, um, um, someone would volunteer as a group reporter and take notes. And then after their discussion period ended, the reporter would provide a summary to when we went back as a large group. And this um, format worked really, really well. And we did it the same way each time. So teens were comfortable with the format and knew what to expect. Um, teens who did not want to be the reporter, nobody was forced to report. So <laughs> the kids who really wanted to, um, to, to talk and were comfortable speaking in front of folks, um, you know, some of them didn't went more than once, but kids who didn't want to do it. But some kids went out of their comfort zone. So that was pretty cool too. Um, we would then go over the three project options for the week that teens could complete at home on their own time. Um, teens had the opportunity to complete either all of the projects or none of the projects. It was completely up to them. Um, but they were responsible for accurately reporting their hours either on Google Forms or via a paper log and then return all of their projects um, at the end of the summer to whichever library. It didn't have to be the one that they picked up the kit in. It could be any branch in our system. The weekly meetings were recorded and teens could make up a week if they couldn't make it, but, but they had to let me know prior to the workshop that they would not be attending in order to make up the hour workshop. Um, they had to answer all of the discussion questions and send their answers to me um, to get credit. And so while my goal for this program overall was to be flexible, I wanted to build in some accountability um, for the teens. Now there, there were instances where like somebody lost internet, of course I'm gonna let them make up the hour. They were trying I and mean, they were contacting some of our staff during the program. That's totally fine. What, what I, I mean is like they can't just flake out and say, oh yeah, I wanna do it now. Um, so at the end of the series, each teen received a verification letter with their reported service hours. And this was on county le letterhead and it was very straight and to the point. Um, you know, Jane Smith um, participated in the teen summer of service program at the Lee County Library System uh, with the Lee County Library System and earned X amount of hours. <clears throat> the pilot program also featured a guest author 
Greg Forbes Sigmund, and he spoke with the teens about his book called The First 30, um, which focuses on leadership, activism, and service to community. So each teen um, that participated received a, a free copy of uh, the book and the accompanying workbook. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the supplies and equipment that are needed for this program, starting with the activity kits. So we packed the activity kits with most of the items needed to complete the projects. I didn't provide some items like, like scissors or markers. I figured they, they should have those at home. If they didn't, they could, they could get some from the library for sure. Um, but for the most part, they had everything they needed. Um, and they had, they had what they needed to complete at least one of the projects um, per week. In the documents for this workshop that you're going to get, um, you'll get a list of projects and supplies. Um, I also personally have an order spreadsheet with the costs and pur uh, purchase links. So if, if you want to contact me after the workshop, um, I can get that to you as well. Um, we ordered 9 by 12 sealable bags from Uline and we used totes to contain all of the sealable bags. And I'll show you a picture of those in just a moment. You'll um, you'll want to have access to a virtual platform that allows breakout groups. So GoToTraining, which is, um, that's what we're using today, is what we used. Um, there was a bit of a learning curve. It seems like, you know, everybody knows Zoom, right? And that's probably the preferred platform. But our county does not use Zoom. We could only use the GoTo platform. So, um, so you definitely want to have that. Um, you're going to want to get yourself a good headphone and microphone for clear communication. Now, granted, the teens might be on their phones and may talk with you with you um, through it like a speaker, but for the most part, I think they're they have their headsets with them or their um, their AirPods, so they they spoke pretty clearly. But in order to clearly communicate with them, you'll want to have that. Also, a Google account a uh, Google account would be helpful. Um, if you're interested in creating a form for recording hours. So the nice thing about the forms is that it puts the info into a spreadsheet, which you can uh, export into Excel. And at the end of the summer, this makes tallying hours a whole heck of a lot easier. So here is a picture of the activity kit and the individual packet. So on the left is the complete kit with the six packets for each session, along with, you'll see the colored pencils, pens, and glue stick. Um, on the right is what one of the weekly packets looks like. So they're clearly marked for the teens to identify. And included in each packet is um, a Discover More handout that I created. Um, it has additional resources on the weekly topic for teens that, um, that may want to learn more or do more um, uh, relating to that topic. Um, on the back are the instructions for the three project options, um, and I also provided a paper log to turn in with each project so we could sort and ID them. If teens filled out the Google form, they would just need to return the project with their name on it. They wouldn't have to return the volunteer form. So the packet was for our week with uh, Keep Lee County Beautiful, um, and the topic was littering and dumping. So um, you'll see like the biodegradable bags and vinyl gloves and chalk and things that go with the projects. So if you're like me, <laughs> you definitely want to know the cost of this program. You know, at the end of the day, what does this uh, cost? And the most awful thing is when you hear about a great program and then you ask about the cost and you find out it was funded through some like million dollar grant or something. So that wasn't the case here. We did have a little bit more flexibility because um, we had remaining program funds. Um, so. Um, first off, registration was limited to 100. I made 120 activity kits just in case we had kids who lost uh, items or, um, you know, somebody who got into the program or the registration kicked them in or whatever. So the total cost for this program was about $2,950, but that was due to the author visit and book purchase. Without the author and books, the 120 kits, that's six weeks worth of stuff cost $950 to make. And there are a few ways to break that down even more. So the cost per week was $189.60. So like when I'm planning for summer programs, I know I have a budget for the summer of X amount of dollars and what I can spend. So, okay, how can I pack a room full of kids and get them to do something for 100, 100 kids at $189.60? So I think that's pretty affordable. And the cost per attendee to participate in the entire program, so 
all six weeks was $7.91. So again, 100 participants, we made 120 kits. So um, planning. So put together a solid program proposal and consider all of your needs. You're gonna to wanna to look at staffing, budget, uh, marketing. You wanna definitely identify your expected outcomes. And I can't stress this enough because um, it's easier to map out a plan when you, when you know your destination. So clearly defined outcomes will help keep the program focused and on budget. So six months out, you're gonna to wanna to identify dates. I highly recommend the same day and time each week. Um, you're going to want to talk to speakers, invite them, and assign an, an, a date to them. Um, work with the speakers to develop topics and projects. So many organizations already have presentations set aside and usually just need to like make a few tweaks to, to something that they already have uh, put together. So, um, and since the projects um, benefit their agency, don't assume you know what they need. Definitely ask them. Um, an example of this was working with Human and Veteran Services. They actually have very specific items that they will accept due to spacing in their office, but also because someone who is homeless cannot carry around full bottles of soap. So they, um, they accept travel size items uh, instead you're gonna to wanna to develop clear guidelines for speakers. So provide them, um, make this super easy for them. You're gonna to wanna to provide them with a list of exactly what is needed to participate in the program. So the 10 minute PowerPoint presentation, a good internet connection, a good mic and headphones, et cetera, those types of things, okay? You'll also want to develop clear guidelines and expectations for the teens. So, you know, what is an acceptable attendance policy for you? How do you want them to communicate with you? What are the basic group guidelines for breakout discussions? Um, how are you gonna handle school forms? Um, those are the types of things you'll wanna sort out way before the program starts, because once these kids are registered, they're gonna come at you with lots of questions. And so you're gonna wanna make sure you're as prepared as possible. And it doesn't mean that you can't adjust as needed, um, but uh, you know it's helpful if you have kind of in your mind where you wanna go, right? So you're going to want to also recruit staff helpers. I, rem I recommend um, at least one person to help with tech issues um, and another to monitor the chat while you moderate. I was actually, um, I was actually kind of nervous at first about the chat and doing, you know, and working not not necessarily with te with the teens. They're there to serve a purpose, right? They want to serve their community and get volunteer hours. But you know, I always get nervous about if somebody. Gets, gets the link and pops in and, and does something. So I had somebody monitor the chat. They also monitor, monitored the chat for questions and things that, um, that the teens needed to know. So, um, and also the breakout rooms, they helped with the breakout rooms. So four months out, you're gonna wanna market your program to teens and start your registration. I emailed the flyer to the head of the Lee County uh, School District of Lee County's guidance uh, department, and she actually distributed to all of the Lee County Public High School guidance departments and middle schools. So that was super helpful. So we also, and we also developed um, a PSA that played on the school news at all the county high schools. So that was really helpful in the promotion. We promoted through Facebook, but that was mostly to parents because the kids aren't on Facebook and Instagram and even with Instagram it's mostly it's like the hipster parents um, because the kids really aren't following our library Instagram account. Um, we also had posters up at all of our branches but um, our registration and waiting list was full within a week so our branches had the posters up for just a few days and then they had to take them down so it was pretty amazing. And here is uh, this is what our uh, summer of service flyer looked at uh, uh, like uh, we sent this through Peach Jar, and this is what we sent to guidance counselors. So we have a graphic designer on our communications team, but I've used I've used Canva on a personal level to make pretty professional. I mean, I think so. Looking flyers. Um, also, notice the QR code at the bottom. So this is perfect for teens that really just don't want paper. They'll take a picture or go right to the site with the info. So that was really nice to have. 
So two months out, um, you're going to want to start purchasing your supplies and assembling your kits. You'll also want to reach out to the teens that registered and verify their pickup location if you have multiple library locations. So if possible, you should probably do this through registration. We didn't have this capacity uh, through our library market setup, so I ended up emailing, calling, and texting a lot of kids, a lot. Um, one month out, you're going to want to send the kits and rosters to the branches for pickup. Um, and the roster just helps staff mark off who picked up their kit. Um, you'll also want to create a spreadsheet for attendance and projects. And this will be a lifesaver as the projects come rolling in and also just uh, tracking attendance as the summer goes on. So now the program started and guess what? There's still a lot of work to be done. <laughs> so, uh, so while you're in session, you're gonna wanna do the following. You're gonna wanna send a follow-up email after each program. And I can't emphasize this enough. And this email should go over anything that came up during the session, including links that were mentioned, additional resources and reminders with important dates. We actually had one program with um, animal services where uh, the teens found out that they had a, a food bank uh, for pet food and asked if she could, instead of doing like the dog toy, if she could put together a pet food drive. And they said, yes. Yeah. So in that follow-up email, I added, hey, here's option number four. <laughs> you can do a pet food drive. So those follow-ups are super helpful. Again, you know, if, if you work with teens or you have teenagers of your own, you, you can't send enough reminders, right? You're also wanna, gonna wanna send uh, reminders for the volunteer paperwork. Um, while some are doing this for altruistic purposes, I'm sure, um, most of the teens in the program will need something signed. And, um, you know, I tell them it, that it's their responsibility to get the forms um, to me and that um, it's their responsibility to make sure the program fits their ser service requirements. I can't go hunting down their pack, you know, their leader or their, their group leader or um, teachers or guidance counselors. It's their responsibility to figure that out. Um, but I tell them, I'm like, I'll sign whatever you need. Just, just let me know, but you have to get the papers to me. Um, you're also going to be fielding questions that come your way about programs and projects, and you're going to do this throughout the summer. They're always going to have um, some questions. Um, during the program, you're also going to want to prepare um, an end of program survey. Maybe you don't have to, this is optional, but this will give your teens an opportunity to provide uh, real honest feedback about the program. And so, you know, you will want to design questions that will pre provide the info like that you really need that would be helpful to you. Um, so, I found that really helpful. And actually a lot of the input that they provided um, has driven how we planned um, Teen SOS for next year. Uh, Amy Jane, we got a question yes. in the chat. Uh -huh. uh, Courtney asked, were these teens registered volunteers at your library? For example, no. our teen volunteers have to apply, give two references and go through a background check. Great question. So we have that same volunteer opportunity. It's a traditional student volunteer where they have to do the two references, the background check and all that stuff. Because this is a program, teens do not, in our system, teens did not have to go through that process. Because the work that they're doing, and I'll talk a little bit about how we're gonna be moving forward with this program in person uh, in, as a hybrid next summer. Because they're working within a, um, within a program, it kind of is a little, I don't wanna call it a loophole because it sound, that sounds like we're sneaking past the rules. It's not. They're still volunteering. They're doing work on behalf of the library for another organization. Um, so no, they do not have to be registered volunteers at our library, although many will either are, were beforehand or will be once we open up volunteer, um, traditional volunteer opportunities. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay, so um, the program wrap up. So once the teens had uh, handed in the completed uh, projects, you're gonna want to sort and verify, okay? Um, you're gonna wanna tally hours and you're gonna have to send out those verification letters to students. So I, I recommend waiting until all or almost all of the projects are in. Um, 
for example, you know, I had a teen that tested positive for COVID at the end of the summer and most likely he, you know, he contacted me and said, I can't hand him my, my projects until September. And that was a okay. And I knew about that. So once the majority of your, um, your kits come in, that's probably a good time to sort and tally so you can get it all done in one, in one boot. Um, and so once you're done with this, make sure you drop off any completed projects with the corresponding agency. Animal Services was very excited to get all of the dog toys. Um, our elections office got some posters and we are in the process of turning the button templates into buttons for them for uh, voting. So they were very excited. And then Human Services, and you'll see a little picture at the end with Human Services. They got a lot of good stuff. So um, remember how I mentioned having defined outcomes earlier? So these are um, the outcomes that drove the development of the program. Teens will learn more about their community and local agencies. Um, teens will have the opportun opportunity um, to earn at least 25 service hours over the summer. And that was attending all of the workshops and completing the most simple of the project options. Um, also, what's not on here is I was hoping that, you know, crossing my fingers that we would get at least 25 kids. Well, here were the actual outcomes. We had 100 teens registered for the program. We had a waiting list. Um, 25 of those teens actually attended a teen summer camp that participated. 11 completely ghosted me, like I couldn't get a hold of them. So I think like maybe mom signed them up and then they were like, who is this lady contacting me? Probably. Um, and then we had 64 that actually attended the full program and were pretty much there every week and part fully participating. Um, teens earned uh, 1,578 hours. Um, and I actually think um, this was, uh, this is low because I, I had a few adjustments after mailing out the verification letters and I had a few kids that turned in projects in September. So um, they, the kids earned anywhere between one and 79 hours, um, which was awesome. I received 34 survey responses. Um, I totally wish it was more. I wish they all returned a survey, um, but I definitely will take what I can get. Um, and then there you see out of the survey responses, 100% said they would recommend this program to a friend and 100% learned something new about an organization or a service that the community offered. And um, that I think is actually even a bigger, greater outcome <laughs> because um, now these kids know about organizations that may be able to help them or help someone that they know. Here's some unexpected outcomes. So, you know, these weren't even on my radar when I developed the program. Um, but, you know, teens are really amazing people. And I'm not just saying it because I'm the mom of two great teens, but I really think that um, they're an awesome group to work with. And this just goes to show that even if you don't create the perfect program at first, they're going to help you shape it into exactly what they need. So don't be nervous about getting started and not having all the answers, okay? Um, one of our teens earned an internship with the guest author and speaker. I think it was like a two or three week internship. So that was really, she was excited for that and her mom was over the moon. Um, they created a Discord group and they invited me to it. So, I mean, that's like a lot of street cred right there, but I couldn't go because I couldn't, I couldn't participate because um, of county policy. But the awesome, awesome part of this Discord group is that my shy kids would talk to the other kids who would either provide the information that the shy kids needed and were afraid to ask, or they, they would come to me and get the info for their friends. So that was super cool. Um, and and it actually, they fielded a lot of questions <laughs> that probably would have come to me otherwise. So they were really helping me out. Um, I am still getting thank yous from teens. Um, the parents thanked me at the beginning, um, all throughout it, and even at the end. And the teens also thanked me all throughout and, and after the program ended. They were so, so grateful that we provided this program. And many, um, many have asked to come back next summer or to have this program back next summer. So um, that was pretty awesome. So, this all sounds beautiful, right? Um, and most of it, and most of it was, I wish I could end the presentation there, but it wouldn't be fair to leave out some of the challenges um, because we can't grow, right? Um, and there weren't that many, but there were a few that we're hoping to do better next year with. 
technology. Oh, okay. So I mentioned earlier that the library is a county department. So we couldn't just hop on Zoom and call it a day, right? Um, so there were restrictions and we had to use GoTo training. And the platform actually did what we needed it to do. It's in it's the platform we're using right now, um, as a matter of fact. But those teens weren't familiar with GoTo training. And there were some differences between the mobile and the desktop web app. And since most teens were using the mobile app, this is, you know, this is just something that was important to know beforehand and communicate clearly to the group. And I did not know this beforehand and did not communicate it clearly. So until we, you know, until we all went out into a breakout group and they couldn't get into it, I really didn't know. So there was a little bit of a learning curve there. Um, communication. Yeah, so I love this meme, um, but the reality is that most teens don't even set up their voicemail. So um, if they don't know your number, they're not going to answer your call. And, you know, frankly, I don't do that either. So it's not really a surprise. Um, so if you're able to set up a method for bulk communication, like the Remind app, I would highly, highly recommend it. Um, even if it's to send out a text that says, check your email for important information about the Summer of Service program. They don't check um, email like we do. Uh, so, you know, so this will help them and kind of prompt them to do what you need to do. Um, I have a work cell. And so I told them to text me whenever they wanted, even if it's 3 a.m. Because I, I, I turn my work cell off when I'm not taking calls. So if they were working on something in the middle of the night, which it's summertime and teens are going to do that, then it, they had a question, then they can totally go and text it to me. And then, you know, if I'm, you know, looking at my, my work cell on, on the afternoon or the next morning, um, then I'll get back to them. Okay, so other challenges that weren't necessarily specific to the overall program, but but had some you know had somewhat of an impact. Um, so this program's all about flexibility. That's really the 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 big thing about this. Um, but there are some deadlines that aren't so flexible, and and then there are other challenges that are completely out of your control. So transportation to pick up and drop off projects. I ended up mailing out a few kits um, uh, for kids who either couldn't get to the library or I had one girl who had to go out of town to uh, Georgia unexpectedly. So I, I mailed the kit to her so that she didn't have to drop out of the program. Because it's virtual, they can take it wherever they need to go. Okay. I also extended due dates for students who couldn't make it to the library or had um, any other uh, pressing event like the kid who ended up getting COVID. Um, decide before the program begins how you want to handle these situations um, because you want to handle it fairly um, and and you want to still try to be flexible but you still need to have boundaries, right? COVID meant that extensions had to be made um, and that you should have a backup presentation on hand or in place in case a guest speaker cancels. One of my, um, one of my guest speakers uh, was about to have he he was going to have to leave town he ended up coming to the program um still but he wasn't sure but i had a backup uh program um that i had on hand just in case um so i did I, so i wasn't too freaked out if if he had to go he had to go um again collecting projects was an issue for some many teens asked for extensions uh almost a majority of them. Um, because these extensions impact when you can tally and get all those verification letters, um, you should have a drop dead due date so that you can plan on sorting and getting those letters uh, out in a timely manner, um, especially to the kids who need to have those letters uh, right when they get back to school. Working with the teen camps was a challenge. Um, the staff changed quite a bit with the camp that we worked with. Um, but then the camp closed and I wasn't notified. So I thought they just dropped out. And then I found out like a couple of weeks after summer ended that the they, were, they had a COVID outbreak and so they closed. So I, perhaps they couldn't contact me because nobody was there, but I had no idea what was going on. And I just thought, oh, okay. So you'll wanna set up some guidelines if you choose to work with teen camps um, on how on how you're, you're gonna communicate with them and, um, and uh, and what the expectations are for them. 
Um, we have a courier that goes from branch to branch, and our courier was actually facing delays. So on top of the extension I provided for the kids, there were also um, now delays getting the project from the drop-off branch to my office at admin. So um, this was completely unexpected. However, you know, I didn't think this through very well uh, because this program ended right when summer reading ended so all my branches were also sending back all the unused srp supplies so our, no wonder why our couriers were like we give up <laughs> so those, those that caused a few delays too um and then just make sure you estimate the time uh needed to verify the projects and hours i guess i didn't realize how enthusiastic um these teens are with completing projects and how many projects they would complete um, because I totally underestimated the time that I would need. Um, and this isn't really a one person job. So I recommend that you work with your branch staff to develop you know, a process for like when the teens are actually returning the completed projects, they check stuff off or input the hours. So that way it's distributed amongst the branches and not just on one person. Again, these are minor, minor challenges. Oops, I think, there we go. So here are some of the projects that the teens completed um, or some pictures of themselves completing the projects. Did I already mention how amazing these kids are? I believe they're really, really amazing. So um, there you see the voted buttons that they're gonna be handing out for elections. Um, there's a picture of Matt Wallace from Human Services and myself and one teen collected all the, those boxes um, filled with items for the homeless. Um, we had bookmarks, they made bookmarks and early literacy cards for the libraries. So here we have teens who are really into manga and um, they were able to create these awesome, awesome bookmarks for us that we're gonna hand out. Uh, animal services, one way teens could get um, hours was to foster cats. And I think I had, I had one teen that fostered cats and I'm like, oh man, I can just imagine like this kid just bringing home like a litter of kittens to his parents. I'm, I'm gonna earn hours but you know whatever it takes right um let's see so here are some recommendations um, and things to consider before starting a program like teen summer of service first is this something your community would benefit from um, do you have the technology and staff to offer this program or something similar and what is your budget now, I mentioned that $29.50, I probably won't have that budget next year, but I'll probably have a grand, so I can do that. Um, you know, so it's just, but you don't need, even need that. You can find a, a lot of those uh, project options were very low cost and just printed materials. So um, you can really design the program to be as high budget or low budget um, as you need it to be. Uh, Amy Jane, we got to... Yes. Um, I thought we have maybe a couple questions. Um, so the first okay. question, Courtney asks, was the primary buy-in for volunteer hours or did you get a lot of teens interested just in general? Um, the It was volunteer hours for sure. Um, a lot of the questions I was getting was, will this count for Bright Futures? Um, and which I can't determine. So I would, I would just have them contact their guidance counselor. Um, I had um, some that were just interested in programs, uh, teen programs. We offered virtual summer reading programs that were pre-recorded for teens, which, you know, I, we, we did it and I was like, this isn't gonna do well, I'm telling you. And so they were looking for something that was interactive. Um, so, but I will say the primary buy-in was definitely to get those volunteer hours. Okay, and then Kate says that in Marion County, Marion County system, they have a group called Young Adult Leading Library Awareness. Um, and did a virtual volunteer service where teens read books, video young adult book reviews, and then this type of thing would add another level to the offerings they already have. And they ask, how many other agencies did you contact in your county? So let's see, um, actually the first, the first five agencies I count I contacted they all agreed to do something oh well one one actually forward okay let me start over I chose to start first with Lee County sister agencies because I figured I could get them to uh, to come and do a program I knew like I knew elections had already done programs for us in person back in the day when we offered um, in-person programming we just started again this month but it seems like forever ago 
Um, and what a great way to highlight county agencies to these to teens who might not know about the services that they're entitled to. Um, so uh, Lee County Solid Waste referred me to Keep Lee County Beautiful for so as a as a partner agency so that's why we worked with them instead of uh, lee county solid waste um, and it sounds nicer than <laughs> lee, keep lee county beautiful or lee county solid waste i don't know <laughs> but um but for next year i already am reaching out to some other organizations like sanibel sea school um they're part of uh, the sanibel captiva conservation foundation and they want to work with us so now i'm branching out to not just um our uh our county agencies but also other uh partner agencies um in the community were there any other questions that i should answer right now Looks like you're good right now. Okay, so I'm actually going to address this um, a little bit. What um, you were just asking. So um, more recommendations. Work within your organization to find potential partners. So are you a county or city department? Other county or city departments will want to work with you. So as I mentioned, I worked with county agencies. We have this philosophy in Lee County called One Org. So even though the library is different from Parks and Rec, is different from solid waste or human services. Wherever we can find a way to collaborate um, and become more efficient and boost one another's services, we're gonna do that. So because we have this philosophy, we find ways to make this work. So um, not every city or community has um, that sort of philosophy, but I think for the most part, uh, you know, who doesn't like to help out the library? <laughs> maybe not parks, maybe not parks and rec, right? Like the parks and rec show. Um, speak with your school guidance department. Um, I can't, I, I can't say that enough um, because you're gonna, you're gonna want to tell them all about the program. They may know of something that's similar that's being offered in your area. So you don't want to duplicate services, right? You're going to want to offer something that's a little bit different, um, or maybe you can save or work together. Um, they can also provide additional leads for speakers. So, um, so they're great to work with. They may also uh, give you an idea of the best way to market the program to uh, local schools and teens. In my case, they sent out the flyers to the guidance counselors because all the kids were going to the guidance counselors and saying, we can't find service. Do you have any idea what, what we can do for service hours? And then they had this flyer. So that helped quite a bit. You're gonna to wanna to advertise to parents. They know what will work for their kids. Um, and they're, you know, the parents want their kids to get Bright Futures hours. I think I went to a workshop once about um, volunteer volunteers. And like for every one Bright Future hour that they receive, it's like 200, over $200. So parents want their kids to get these, these hours too. So they know what will work for their kids and they'll let their kids know. You're also gonna to wanna to listen to your teen. So are there specific topics that they wanna learn more about or is there another way they prefer to communicate? If you ask, um, they're gonna tell you uh, and sometimes they'll tell you even if you don't ask them. So, um, so that's, they're pretty great though with helping design your program. So moving forward, I mentioned uh, this a little bit. Um, the teen SOS program was a pilot program, but it's now going to be a permanent hybrid program that we offer throughout our system with both virtual and in-person options. Um, so that's going to be offered next summer. Um, teens will either be able to come in to the library and um, participate in the teen SOS program, or they can attend virtually. Um, the kids who are in, in person, um, they're going to see the guest speaker virtually, and then they will do the breakout groups and everything, and even maybe uh, work, start working on some projects inside the branch, whereas the virtual um, participants will continue to, um, to participate uh, just like they did this past summer. Um, I also will have an introduction workshop to test out the tech, um, and troubleshoot that and give a basic overview, overview um, of what to expect and that will um, kick off the summer. And then um, if, I, if I choose to have a guest speaker again um, to talk about leadership and service, um, the teens had asked or they, the feedback I received that it would be better to have 
that person, that guest speaker at the beginning of the summer to sort of like hype them up. Um, new presenters, I'm going to rotate new presenters into the program for teens um, because I expect that I'll get returning kids and I don't want the, um, the, the information to get stale. So remember, this program is for ages 12 and up, so we may have teens that participate for several summers. Um, I don't want to exclude teen summer camps, uh, but there needs to be better guidelines and expectations, like I mentioned before, um, sort of what I developed for the speakers and the teens. Um, I also plan on getting rid of the logging sheet and strictly use Google Forms for logging. It totally streamlines the process and, and like most of the teens used it anyway to record hours. So the um, volunteer log sheet was kind of confusing and some kids completed both the Google hours, um, the Google form and the logging sheet. So it, it just made more work for me. So I, you know, these kids are tech savvy, they get it. Now be prepared because you might have a kid who doesn't have access to Google forms. And in that, but that's the minority I believe. And, and if you have something set up, uh, for them, um, then you can work something out. But generally, they're all tech savvy. So um, ad some additional resources. These are the resources and templates that may be helpful um, if you decide to create a, a similar program. Um, there's also a packet of info that includes the Discover More handouts that is available. Um, so here you'll see the landing page for the Summer of Service program, which is still, it's still live. It, I think it says the program's full or the program's over. Um, I have to update that. The Google Forms volunteer logging sheet is there, so you can see what an example was. We, we took the Google uh, uh, link and we actually created a bit.ly um, to make it easier for the kids to remember for them to log. The Google Forms survey template, if you want to see um, what we're asking, what I asked the kids, um, and then also the link to the PSA that we played in the schools is there. It's a very short and brief and basically like you need hours, we got them, come sign up. Very short and sweet. So. Um, Thank you, thank you for uh, letting uh, me talk at you for the better part of an hour. Um, does anyone have any questions that I can answer? I'd love to answer uh, them and provide any additional info that would be helpful to you. Thank you so much, Amy Jane. I'm sure there have got to be some questions bubbling. Um, so I did just want to offer a reminder that not only do we have the chat, but if anybody has a microphone and you'd like for us to unmute you, you can click that hand raise button um, and we'll be happy to do that as well. Um, I also wanted to put out a reminder that um, whenever I send my follow up, um, you will receive a copy of the recording. You will also receive a version of the PowerPoint slides and the materials packet that involve um, Amy Jane's specific projects and um, all the forms and sheets that she had with that. Okay, Amy Jane, we got a couple questions. Um, let's see, uh, Kate asked, will the presentation be available later? But like Casey said, um, you'll get it in a follow-up and we are also gonna have it on YouTube. Uh, Karen asks, do you have a teen advisory board? So our, okay, so there are a few ways to answer this. Yes, we're getting there. So um, we are overhauling all of our teen services right now. We just put together a teen task force that met um, last year, uh, last month rather. Um, this was supposed to happen um, about, I don't know, like a year and a half-ish ago, um, but we all know what happened. And then programming has been on pause. So we don't even have uh, volunteers back in our library yet. And teen program just like started again, uh, started up in-person teen programming um, six days ago. So um, yes, some of our uh, some of our libraries are starting uh, teen advisory groups right away. Um, and we're working right now on, because we're a larger system, we're working on setting up guidelines that can be followed um, across the board um, so that there's some sort of consistency on expectations for teen advisory groups. Those teens um, that are in part of the teen advisory group won't have to go through the volunteer application like traditional teens that 
um, volunteer in the workroom area and kind of prep for programs. So again, that provides a little bit more flexibility. Okay, and then uh, Kate asks, could we have your contact info again? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me go to the very front. Me and Chewy. There we go. Perfect. Yeah, and definitely if you want to ask, um, if you have specific questions that are, you know, questions that are specific to your location and you just want to kind of use me as a soundboard to talk things through, um, I can definitely give me a call or shoot me an email. Uh, Sarah says that they got a lot out of this. It's a whole new way of thinking about doing summer program programming. So they thank you for that. Um, You're welcome. The great thing is that even though this program was triggered by COVID, some of the problems still exist. Like teens are usually at home during the summer, but don't have transportation. They need flexibility because they have so many other responsibilities and commitments, um, you know, with school and some are working, some watch their younger brothers and sisters. So the flexibility, I mean, let's make this I don't want to say make it as easy as possible. Again, there needs to be accountability, but offering a program that's flexible, it just it's it's like showing some compassion and understanding of what they're what they're dealing with on a daily basis. Uh, Courtney asks, when will the recording be available? Uh, Courtney, I should have it up on YouTube uh, later today or early tomorrow morning, and I believe Casey said their follow up email will be tomorrow. That right, Casey? Yes, I'll send that out in the morning. Sometimes it depends on how long the system takes to process the recording. <laughs> right, <exactly. laughs> sometimes it can take 15 minutes, sometimes it can take hours. Exactly. Depends on how how active tech is feeling. And Courtney also says, do you think there's a way to make this experience part of the collection, like a kit that you could circulate? I'm sure, I'm sure you you could figure out something where I guess if you had a kit where you replenish supplies, um, I, I'm not sure how that would work, but that is another way where I guess it could be done throughout the year um, if they just checked out a kit, a volunteer kit to do at home. I think a big part of this program though, um, outside of actually doing and making the project was that kids were hearing from the the people who were actually solving problems in their community. So they were hearing about a problem or challenge, right? But then they were also hearing about what the adults in their community were doing to help people. And because there was a face attached to it um, and like a little presentation too, and then they got to talk with other, with their peers about um, this issue and kind of brainstorm different ideas and ways to handle situations. I think they got more out of that part rather than just, um, you know, picking up um, a kit with uh, like a tennis ball and a sock and making um, and making a dog toy. Okay, and Lacey asks, how did teams make up hours when they couldn't attend the virtual event? Yeah, so, and, and that happened. We had kids who were working, we had kids who had other engagements or were going on family vacations and couldn't and didn't have um, internet access. And that was totally okay. I just told them that I needed them to contact me prior to the start of the program and let me know that they wouldn't be attending. And then once they, um, when I sent that follow-up email, I included a, a link to the recording and they had to watch the recording and in the recording had the discussion questions. So they would have to watch the recording, pause, because I wasn't just gonna give them the questions. So they had, a, they had to pause it and then answer the questions and then email them back to me. Um, and they would have to answer all of them. So you know how I said each group I divided up the groups and each group would have one question. Well, the kids would have to answer all of them and they did it. They did it. Um, we had quote, most of the kids who missed a virtual program, they, um, they made up the hour. And then Rebecca asks for stats, the workshop would be active and the project portion would be passive. Okay. So yeah, the workshop, 
was considered active participation because it was a live interactive um, virtual program. The project was a self-directed program. We provided the instructions and the materials, and then they did it on their own and completed it. And we used to call we used to call them passives, but now we have to we have to call them self self directed. So, okay, yeah. Okay, Mary asks to clarify: Did your teens only earn hours for the virtual program, or did they earn hours for the time they spent on the projects too? They also earn time for they, that they spent on the projects as well. And this, this is the time, like I kept track of the attendance hours because GoToTraining gives me an attendance report and it shows me, I one great thing about GoToTraining is it tells me how long, um, it tells me how long people were online. So I can see if somebody just showed up and then was there for 20 minutes and then hit the highway. Um, and I or I can see if they were there for the full hour. And I let them know this, like I can see how long, you know, the attendance, because they asked me and I said, the attendance report I get, and it tells me exactly how long you've been on. And like, I can see if you're actively participating in the program or if you're opening up another screen and, and playing video games. Like, I don't know what you're doing, but I can see that you're not with us. And so I, you know, I mean, I put it out there because now they know um, I want them to get the most out of the program. So they received uh, hours for both. And I found that um, the, uh, the hours were pretty consistent among the kids, but I don't wanna assume like, okay, if you're gonna do the dog toys, I'm, I'm gonna give you an hour for that. Like I didn't place the time on that. I had kids with different, um, all different types of abilities um, participating in the program. And I'm not going to assume that it took uh, any kid a certain amount of time to do a project, especially when you look at things like those bookmarks where you can tell, um, that participant put in a lot of time um, working on those bookmarks where other kids, you know, maybe made a geometric pattern that didn't take as much time, so. Lacey asks, what time of day did you do the virtual events? Did you do them at the same time and day every time? Yeah, they were Thursdays, oh, was it one o'clock or two o'clock? I, you know, when summer's over, I'm on to planning next summer, so I, I quickly forget. Um, it was either one or two o'clock. Um, I, uh, I did it in the ap afternoon on purpose, um, as a mom of two teens, uh, I, they don't wake up early and why my kids wake up at like five o'clock every day to go to school. So if they can sleep in during the summer, I'm going to let them enjoy that while they can, um, before they turn into an adult and have to wake up early again. So, um, we did it in the afternoon. Um, and so that worked out really well. And it was the same day and time every week. Are there any other any other questions? Right now the chat is Empty. Oh, we got one. Um, well, uh, Kate says there are some really great ideas you've presented, so thank you. You're welcome. And I think we can all agree with Casey when she says you definitely have some talented artists in your SOS crew. Yes. Yeah, and each week had, there was like an art project each week. Um, and it was funny because one of, <laughs> one of the kids from the survey, the feedback was there were too many art projects and I was like oh so many kids took advantage of the art projects so wonderful well we are at three o'clock on the dot um so I want to make sure that we do get everybody out on time um, but you all have Amy Jane's contact information if you want to reach out and again um I will have that follow-up email with all the materials and recording and powerpoint tomorrow Amy Jane thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this webinar for us um I I knew it was going to be great when you talked about it early in the year in our brainstorming sessions um and so I I 
genuinely appreciate that you were so willing to to take the time and put the effort into coming back and kind of telling us about you know how it went and um you know how you're going to move forward with it and it's such a scalable program um, which is wonderful so thank you everybody i hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week and we will see you online in the future for some of our other webinars have a good afternoon you too thanks